Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Janice Oliva, President of ISE Magazine. Welcome to today's ISE webinar, OTDR, Testing for Today's High Speed Networks, presented in partnership with Light Brigade. Before we get started, please remember to, if you've requested to receive a Bixi CEC, you will receive one credit for attending this live webinar. Please note that the Bixi CEC credits are not available for the recorded uh, portion of a webinar. So now we're going to continue on and talk about the content of this uh, webinar today. It's talking about testing fiber spans with an OTDR requires understanding its wide array of capabilities. As systems migrate to higher speeds, the OTDR remains a critical tool for characterizing an optical span for attenuation and distance. However, it is becoming increasingly important to add optical return loss, or ORL, and component reflectance measurements to standard OTDR testing practices. Reflected optical power contributes to, sign to signal quality degradation of the fiber optic system, especially at high data rates. This session will focus on the OTDR capabilities when measuring for ORL and reflectance, as well as when testing through splitters in FTTX pond installations. In addition, we will discuss how ITU maintenance wavelengths can be applied for more effective acceptance testing and maintenance programs. As an attendee today, you will be learning how uh, the impact of high attenuation splices and connections for high-speed systems, why dynamic range pulse width and averaging are critical in FTTX PON system testing, and what OTDR tests are performed in the long and ultra-long bands. But before we get started, I would like to remind everyone to please register for IFE Expo 2017, being held this September 12th through the 14th at the Orange County Convention Center in Orlando, Florida. You can get additional information at ISEXPO.com. And if you haven't already, please also don't forget to sign up for your complimentary copy of ISE Magazine, the how-to resource for ICT providers across the globe. The link is on your screen as well as in the information tabs of this webinar. Now, some details about our sponsor and presenter. Today's webinar would not be possible without our sponsor, Light Brigade. Light Brigade has instructed more than 50,000 attendees in its public and custom classes since 1987. The company offers a variety of fiber optic courses that cover basic fiber optic design, maintenance and testing, as well as more advanced topics such as fiber characterization and FTTX. We will also, uh, they do provide course development services and will custom create a course to any fiber object, optic subject matter or skill level. And in addition, Light Brigade produces professional quality educational DVDs and online training. And all of Light Brigade's training materials are technology-based and demonstrate theory and techniques applicable to any manufacturer's product. So now I'd like to introduce to you our presenter, Mr. Larry Johnson. Larry is a director and founder of Light Brigade and has been at the forefront of fiber optics industry since 1977. Mr. Johnson has built a solid reputation in all aspects of fiber optic design, installation, implementation, testing, and measurement. And he participated in the early development of fiber optic standards used for installation, testing, and measurement of network and physical plants, and continues to monitor standards activities. His leadership in the optical fiber industry has resulted in repeated invitations to speak at key conferences worldwide and to develop fiber optic certification programs for a variety of industries, including ours at ISE Expo. So finally, we're just going to talk about a few logistics here uh, regarding today's webinar. Some of you may already know this, but for those who don't, the information tabs are at the top of your screen. They will allow you to find out more information about our speaker and sponsor. 
The Event Resources tab on the left side will allow you to download a copy of today's slides uh, from the presentation at any time. And then finally, you can submit questions throughout the presentation. Um, we encourage that because it helps you benefit from this uh, presentation most, uh, most of all using the Ask a Question tab. We'll hold all these Q&As till the end of the presentation, at which time we'll then do an open uh, Q&A session and we'll answer as many as possible. But if we don't have time to answer your question, please don't fret. We will take, um, we'll be having all the contact information and reach out to you offline. So with that, I'd like to hand the webinar over to our presenter, Larry. Thanks, anyway. Janice. That was a great introduction. I appreciate it. And thanks for everybody to take uh, time out of your day, wherever you are. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn and, and again, uh, to build on what Janice said about the ISE conference this September is uh, on September 12th, the pre-course is one of the sessions is on OTDR Advanced Workshop short course courses. So um, look forward to putting a lot more content, but we have a lot more time in that session, plus have the instruments there. So let's look at the agenda, so basic introduction. Um, the functions of the OTDR, uh, the impact of uh, the reflections on high-speed systems, and the, what is optical return loss and reflectance testing and how do they, what differentiates them. And then we also want to spend time on the ITU standards and what's being specified for troubleshooting shooting and maintenance uh, for current and future systems. And then, of course, we want to summarize that. So the... Um, the OTDR, again, one of these acronyms that we just throw around all the time, but it actually means Optical Time Domain Reflectometer. And uh, it, this instrument, uh, the first field instrument uh, was issued in 1980, so we're in our 37th year, to, year of experience with it. Um, but they all basically have done the same thing. It's just that we've really tweaked them to get much higher performance, uh, from them go from an AC unit to a DC unit, um, uh, information, memory storage, waveform storage, uh, just a lot of great capabilities. But what do we use it for? It measures fiber length. And notice we don't say cable length, it's fiber length in that, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. It measures distances to different events, whether those are um, splices, connections, passive devices such as splitters, or um, problems such as macro bins, micro bins, or fiber breaks in general. Um, it also allows us to differentiate an individual component reflectance versus a span reflection level called optical return loss. And we measure in both dB and dB per kilometer, and that so depending on what type of test we're doing. We use it as a quality control instrument um, for those that perform splicing functions. Tells us the distance, the loss, and if it's a mechanical splice, the reflectance as well. But we can also use it for other things. We can monitor a cable, and we'll talk about this uh, further into the presentation. And of course, whether you're using it in a quality assurance role, such as a manufacturer, or in a quality control role, such as uh, contractors, um, that's a perfect instrument for it. So if we look at testing the physical plant or the outside plant, the test that we perform is to, to measure the amount of signal loss or attenuation in the fiber and, of course, the fibers within the cable, but also to measure the span loss, the individual loss values, whether they are for splices or splitters or connections, give us documentation for these and at the same time, and even very important today, is the importance of measuring ORL and reflectance values. Now, Telcordia also has a term called full, full feature OTDR, so I want to explain the term. What full feature does is it takes the OTDR beyond the, the normal instrument and allows us to um, measure um, dispersion, for example, chromatic dispersion or PMD, but it, we can also use it as a switch, we can use it as an inspection device, a light source, a power meter, even an optical spectrum analyzer by this full function capability or full feature capability. And on the, the trace to the right, we'll show periodic traces and that in this case so we're doing an overlay with uh, the original 13 10 nanometer and a 1550 but nanometer, but we will show that one uh, later. 
Now, there will be some animations periodically, and you see the blank slide here uh, on the screen, but uh, we'll activate that in a second. So one of these I want to talk about is how OTDRs work. And this is by the theory of Raleigh backscatter, and it's caused by impurities introduced during the manufacturing process. And it causes rays to be reflected in all directions, including back to the OTDR. And it's that reflectance coming back to the OTDR, but these minute levels that uh, allows the OTDR to actually make a measurement for it. So let's uh, activate the, the animation here, take a look at it, and then I'll come back. Okay, so as you saw from the from the animation was that uh, we get a discrete light path, a mode, and it reflects off impurity. Some of that energy comes back to the OTDR itself, and, that, and that's what we're measuring. And of course, the further out we are, the more it's attenuated, and because we're, uh, we know the speed of light by the index of refraction, we can determine the fiber attenuation because of this. Now, the second uh, type of reflection that the OTDR measures is Fresnel reflections. Um, and that, so um, in this case, these are abrupt optical changes that occur, and whether they're glass to glass, such as a mated pair of connections, um, or a glass to air interface, uh, which would happen after, say, a pigtail splice at the far end patch panel or even an open splitter port. These are very abrupt optical changes, and they're easy to identify, uh, but these are the ones that affect the performance of the laser itself. So let's look at another uh, animation here showing a Fresnel reflection. Okay, so as you could see from the uh, the animation, we have an abrupt optical surface. In this case, for the uh, purpose of the animation, the it was a flat end face. So what we try to do is angle or spherically polish the end face of the uh, connector so we minimize the amount of light being reflected. And we will show some... Um, um, different values for different types of polishes over the years as well. Okay, so let's, uh, those are the reflectance uh, um, um, principles. So now some other signatures. Um, first, over to, to the top left and uh, the next one where the A cursor is, you'll see a two Fresnel reflections. And then where the cursor B is on the screen with the red circle around it, this is a non-reflective signature. And in this case, we see the, the trace drop off. And this could be caused by a fusion splice, could be caused by a macro bend, could be caused by a micro bend, uh, could be caused by a fused by conical taper, a type of splitter where fibers are fused together within. All these effects would show the same characteristics of being non-reflective. Okay. If we compare this to a reflective signature, now we see the two Fresnel reflections we saw before. The one on the far left is a very abrupt and, and very high, and that's it's the connection actually on the OTDR itself. And uh, this is the one connection we need to take the most care of in cleaning because if it's damaged, the instrument goes back to the factory and it's out of your hands. So we always want to clean this connector 100% of the time before we ever made a, a, a jumper to it. But um, reflective signatures, Fresnel reflections, are caused by connectors, uh, mechanical splices, the ends of the fiber, lens to components, and again, open connector ports. Okay. Now, what will happen if we get a, a high degree of reflectance, then we end up getting a false signature, and these are called ghosts. And, that, and if you notice on the screen, you'll see that the ghost reflections are double the distance from a prior event, 
and the, the amplitude of the reflection drops in that. Um, so we want to be able to identify these, but there are some basic rules uh, that we can have. Let's look at the uh, next trace. One is, besides they're double the distance, is that if you uh, make a measurement through a ghost uh, signature, there's no attenuation through them. In this case, we put we did a two marker method with the A and B cursors being used, and there would be some attenuation just because the distance between A and B, but it would be into the hundredths of a, a dB very easily. But there's literally no and because there's no ghost there. It's just a false image, and that and that just tells us the sensitivity of the OTDR to, to measure very minute reflections. So in this trace, I wanted to show some of the signatures all at once. So uh, we get the Fresnel reflection to the far left, and that then we get a, a macro bend, um, non-reflective, a fusion splice, non-reflective. An angled PC, which is slightly reflective, and we're just talking about a very small Fresnel reflection from this because of the eight degree angle on the connection. Then we go back in time to the physical contact polish connectors, which these came out in the ni early 90s. And you may still have some of these in your plant. And it's something that we need to be concerned with as we go to higher speeds, because you may have to replace older PC polish connectors. But these are normally in about the 35 to 40 dB range, where the, con the standard connector today uh, would be the UPC or ultra physical contact polish connector, and that would be in the range of about 50 dB. And then a, um, a cleaved fiber end. That's an abrupt end face at, at the, the far end, um, so we're going to see a lot of reflectance on it. That's a glass to air interface on that. So, what is reflectance? It is the percentage of light that's actually reflected by a single component. So if we're looking with the OTDR, we may be blinded because of the distance of the pulse width versus the distance to an event. But if, say, like in the example of the, the top panel here, we have APC connectors because they're color-coded green, and we have ultra-physical contact connections color-coded blue on the bottom side. So each of these have different reflectance level with the APC being in the 60, 65 dB range and the UPC being in the 50, 55 dB range. But we can actually measure what the individual reflectance is from any of these. But things to look for that increase reflectance is open connector ports and these that have dust caps, believe it or not, it's a glass to air interface and highly reflective. Fortunately, it's so far down the span that the reflectance, uh, by the time it comes back into the laser source, would be minimized. And we'll show um, uh, an example of that in a while. Uh, contaminated connections uh, increase the reflectance as well. Uh, improper cleaning techniques or products such as isopropyl alcohol would do the same. Uh, mechanical splices, even though they have index matching gels or fluids to reduce Fresnel reflections, they still are reflective. And any type of lensed components, which we do use in bulk, uh, bulk optics and fiber optics uh, in that, and at times they may be used in WDM systems or DWDM systems. Um, so one thing is, is a high Fresnel reflection can throw an entire optical return loss value off. Um, and that, so if your ORL value is said is 35 dB in that, but it ends up being 30, um, then we're going to need to find out what the culprit or the cause of it is, and we'll do that by looking at individual components. Okay. So what is optical return loss? Well, if, com if reflectance is the individual reflectance level of a component, then optical return loss is the sum of the span. And that includes the uh, Raleigh backscatter and the fiber, any Fresnel reflections by any of the connections or splitters, um, any devices at all. So it's a sum number, and it is this number that system manufacturers are looking for to say that if given a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 12, that you should get um, this performance if your ORL value is greater than this number. And that, so we're always comparing ORL to system performance. So um, you need to know what the expectations are from the system manufacturer as well. So let's look at lasers for a second because they're the, the device that uh, 
the the reflectance causes problems with and as we see lasers an acronym and it's the 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 word amplification in uh, the laser that creates a problem so lights being reflected then it internally amplifies and is being readmitted back out uh, through the laser's facet and uh, it's this point that causes it's not part of your signal so therefore it has to be noise and that and so it degrades the quality of the uh, the signal itself and in um, single mode transmission we use two types of lasers uh, the Fabre Perot laser which the highest speed ones uh, can handle 10 gigabits per second but most are two and a half gigabits and less and the, the higher performance distributed feedback laser which is used in DW DM systems, high speed systems, more powerful lasers, um, very narrow spectral width type requirements, but again, they're going to cost more as well. Um, these are solid state devices and that, and whether they're modulated directly or indirectly doesn't matter. Now, the last bullet, though, is when they're integrated with an optical isolator, they can reduce reflections. The problem is most of the time users don't know if an isolator has been placed in front of the laser. An isolator is an optical valve that allows the light to transmit out through it but it uh, diminishes the amount of reflected light. And so it's always better to have isolators, but again, that's part of the transmitter specifications. And from the outside plant perspective, we have to assume that there's no isolator on the laser. And then, so what does, uh, how does the laser affect it? So first, all lasers are susceptible to reflections and therefore they affect signal quality. The reflected energy disturbs the standing optical wave itself in the laser cavity, and this increases the noise floor of the laser, and Fresnel reflections are the, the primary cause of this. And so they degrade the laser's RIN, or, or relative intensity of noise performance, which creates instabilities and increase the effective noise output of the laser. And that. So we want to try to uh, to minimize these effects. So um, when we talk about optical reflection, it's the light returning into its uh, originating material um, when it encounters an interface of two materials with different refractive indices. Um, again, glass to glass, glass to air, and that. And again, what return loss is and what optical return loss is. Now, the calculation down at the bottom is actually pretty simple, and it's one that I just want to point out. So if the reflectance was a glass-to-air connection, which is about 15 dB, and it's you know uh, 10 dB away, let's say 20 kilometers at a half dB per kilometer, then that means the actual amount of optical reflectance hitting the laser is actually at minus 25 dB. And that's, and that. But let's look at an uh, animation here. And then you'll see what happens to the laser. A simple animation, but I think it gets its point across. So the laser is pulsing. The, the, the energy goes to, the, to a, Fresnel, a point of it where the Fresnel reflection is. That energy comes back into the laser cavity and then disrupts the effectiveness of the laser itself. Okay. Um, so now let's look at the phenomena of different, uh, different effects here. So the closer the component that causes the reflection to the laser itself is the, the, the greatest impact to it. So if we look at item number one, that's our transmitter connector. Now remember, the manufacturer knows the laser. They know whether there's an isolator on it or not. So they're taking care to match up to their specifications. So it's always important that you're matching the connector type and the polish to that of the manufacturer with your patch cords going to your patch panel. The second um, highest level reflectance is the first connection at the patch panel itself. 
And so here we're getting, we're probably a half dB down for the loss in the patch cord. So again, um, uh, a major concern. And this is why we want to make sure that we're buying good quality pigtails, good quality patch cords uh, with specified reflectance levels and, and that for those products. And you really want to make sure that the company is testing for reflectance when they're manufacturing those because it's, it's so close to the, the laser transmitter, it will affect the system. Then there's the Raleigh backscatter in the fiber itself. Then in this case, in item three, we have a optical splitter placed some distance away from the uh, transmitter, and, and in this case, it could be up to 20 kilometers, assuming it's a passive optical network itself. And again, while a 1 by 32 splitter will have approximately 15.8 dB of attenuation, um, if you have several of those ports and they're capped, and that so that means that's a glass to air interface uh, at that uh, at that point, and that where all the rest would have uh, connections there, and that would be glass to glass. So that reflection is going to be much lower. So if you are having noise problems coming from an optical splitter, it's probably a case where you have an open port, and you just need to uh, place an optical terminator matching the connector type and polish into that uh, port. Make sure that again they're clean, and that. Then again, we have spans of optical fibers or cables going out. There may be a, another patch panel at the far end, uh, and in this case, we have another connection. And then finally, we get to the receiver where there's a connector on the receiver. That connector also has a glass-to-air interface uh, between the fiber and the photodiode itself. But that attenuation from um, item 5 would be attenuated in the reverse direction all the way to the laser, and that's going to drop the attenuation levels uh, or the reflectance levels and the attenuation levels down tremendously. And that's, So the one you really have to take care of and uh, pay the most attention to is that first connection. And this will make sense later when we want to talk about... Uh, using um, a dead zone boxes for making these measurements. Okay. So let's. Uh, these are the different uh, single mode polishes that have come out uh, over the years. Um, the top one I put in because if you look at the IEEE 802.3 standard uh, for Ethernet, and we are doing carrier grade Ethernet now, in a, and in campus environments, uh, single mode fiber is being used. But the specification for these in the past was noted as a reflection level of 26 dB, which uh, for use with a Fabry Pro or a uh, DFB laser is pretty bad. And that, so we want to be make careful, uh, be careful with this. Matter of fact, the the, the latest TIA 568D standard increased that number to 35 dB, so um, about one tenth of the uh, the tolerance on reflectance. So the PC, though, this was the the first spherically polished. Uh, uh, connector polish that uh, came out in the early 1990s, and this would be about 40 dB, or w but roughly one hundredth of one percent of the light would be reflected back toward the laser. Um, and then later we improved on that, and that was called the super physical contact uh, polish. And today we're at the ultra physical contact uh, polish, uh, which is. Great for digital systems, analog systems, you uh, have to go to the angled physical contact polish. Also, dense wavelength division multiplex systems use the APC and fiber to the home. But um, the reason for fiber to the home is the patch panel manufacturers don't know if it's an analog or digital signal, so they're putting the APC there uh, so they can handle uh, either type of protocol as well. Now. Not that we deal with uh, uh, multi-mode uh, in the outside plant, but just to give you some values on what multi-mode polishes uh, are, these are typically uh, the glass to air at 14, 15 dB, uh, flat contacting about 20 dB or 1% of the light. The, the only reason they can tolerate these levels is because light emitting diodes are insensitive to reflections, number one, and the vertical cavity surface emitting lasers are extremely uh, insensitive to reflections. So I, I'm always fearful, though, that somebody who does multi mode work does single mode work and starts hand polishing a connector thinking they're going to get around with, uh, with the attenuation and the reflectance level. But you you can see how these have changed, but one of the key points I want to talk about is those that have had 
fiber systems put in for decades. Because when you put that system in, the best polish, if you put it in in 1990, the best polish you could have got was a PC at 40 dB. And that today, your reflectance levels may require a 55 or 65 dB reflectance level. That means that you're going to need the OTDR to, to identify that these reflections are very high. They were great at the time. They're just not going to pass today. And that means that you may have to re-splice pigtails and replace patch cords to make sure that you bring these uh, in terminations up to current levels. Okay. Um, Okay, so here's a couple examples on, a, on an OTDR. The, the left example is uh, showing a glass-to-air interface, and, uh, and so we're at uh, roughly minus 15 dB, which is typical glass-to-air. Uh, and then over to the right side, we see where the reflectance is lower on screen, and this is a 40 dB. So this would be a PC-type polish from the 90s. You can see where we've suppressed the amplitude of the pulse itself. Um, but this still would not pass current levels uh, requiring a much higher level. Now, um, let's, uh, let's go ahead to the, the next uh, um, span chart here. And what you'll see is what's called a dead zone limitations. Now, a dead zone is a term that we use to define the area that, a, that an OTDR cannot measure in. And that, and so, in the TIA 455 test and measurement standards, there's three different fiber optic test procedures, FOTP 59, 60, and 61, that define that the that a launch box, a launch length, a dead zone box should be 20 times the minimum pulse width of the OTDR. Now, because most people don't look at the pulse width measurements and then go out and buy a dead zone box or pulse suppressor, whichever term you want to use. Um, the IEC 61280-4-2 test and measurement standard uh, makes it a little easier because they suggest either buying these in 100, 500 meters or 1,000 meters, one kilometer uh, links instead. As long as they, they're over 20 times the minimum pulse width, you're okay. That it gives us enough distance um, between the uh, the OTDR and the, for, the Fresnel reflection. So in essence, what this screenshot is showing is we pushed out the first patch panel uh, a kilometer, and then we have another dead zone box at the other end of that one, so we push out the... Um, so we can differentiate the reflection at the patch panel, which is actually the third event that you're seeing on screen. It looks like the second, the, the, the smaller one, but there's actually one at the very beginning. It's hard to see. And then we're seeing an abrupt glass-to-air interface in the, about the middle of the screen. And you can see that because it's reflecting so much light, it's causing a ghost over to the right. Matter of fact, the dead zone box and uh, the far end connection are ghosting. You can see they're the same distance apart from each other, but they're also equal distance from the, the signature that you're seeing on trace. So, um, if we're using a dead zone box, what it allows us to do um, is the, the front panel connection be the first Fresnel uh, reflection that you're seeing on top. The patch panel would be the second and the third reflections and the fourth uh, reflection would be the, uh, the, again, the end of the dead zone box itself. Now, what this allows us to do is use the OTDR's capabilities to measure attenuation and reflectance. So now we can isolate each of those uh, Fresnel reflections other than one and four, because one and four will always be glassed at, well, either it's up against zero distance, number one, so we're not going to be able to measure it, and number four, it's glassed air, and it's not going to matter anyway, because that's uh, beyond what we're measuring. What we do want to measure, though, is the attenuation through that first connection, and normally that will include the pigtail splice as well. So if we take a value, uh, 0.7, uh, excuse me, 0.5 dB, for a connection per the Telcordia GR20 uh, values, and then we take a 0.1 dB um, maximum splice loss. If we made an attenuation measurement through that second event, it shouldn't be any higher than 0.6 dB on attenuation. But at the same time, if the reflectance value was uh, minus uh, 55, then 
Um, in that case, we would meet spec for the reflection criteria for a UPC connector. If it was an APC, the reflectance would be lower and uh, the value would be higher. The photo to the right, by the way, is a technician here is inserting an optical ten uh, terminator into one of the connector ports. A terminator looks like a uh, connector in a rubber boot, except there's no jumper out of the end. The end of the fiber has literally been dead-ended, or sometimes called Z-splice, so that there's no reflection off of it. Um, the bottom graphic shows where we have a dead zone box on the front end, and then we have a terminator at the far end. That means that we can measure the reflectance at the far end, but we can't measure the attenuation through the connector and the pigtail splice. So the top graphic is the recommended one with two dead zone boxes in use. And of course, this also means that you have two people where OTDRs are typically uh, and historically only been a one-person instrument. Now we have to have somebody cleaning the connector at the far end and changing um, the dead zone box port to port as well. So there's a variety of test standards that define OTDR measurements. Uh, the TIA 455, uh, the North American Test and Measurement Standard, FOTP 8, and FOTP 107, again, fiber optic test procedures. And by the way, FOTPs are a unanimous vote in the standards bodies. It's not majority vote. If somebody disagrees with the test measurement, they have to, to show proof why it wouldn't work to their counterparts and peers. And then if they have justification for it, that's why you'll get test method A or test method B. So the, there's a res solution, but uh, that they uh, are defined and they are very traceable measurements. The IEC 60793 and the 61280 test and measurement standards, again, these are very uh, highly recommended test and measurement standards, and uh, they tend to be taking the lead over the TIA and newer technologies and so forth. And a couple titles here. But let's uh, talk about a few other standards, too. In the transmission standards, the, the IEEE 802.3 uh, uh, Ethernet standard, but the BA version, which is for 40 and 100 gigabit uh, Ethernets, gives different values for multi-mode and single-mode fibers. And again, we're seeing some of these legacy numbers, in that, and these are optical return loss numbers, uh, which are extremely um, low numbers in that, and they should be uh, should be higher. And that where the ITU does telecommunication group numbers and that we're seeing more practical uh, levels in that. And these just happen to be the BPON and GPON FTTX standard values. And then uh, we have the G.957, which is a SONNET interface standard giving us the minimum optical return loss values as well. And uh, as, you know, as I mentioned earlier, in the 568D standard, 568.3-D, uh, they changed the value to 35 dB for single-mode fiber as well. So the system standards are also giving us values that we want to meet, and those are optical return loss values, where test and measurement values uh, will give you reflectance values, not uh, uh, ORL. So there's some newer uh, activities taking place in, in the ITU, and uh, these are uh, into the L uh, series, which are construction installation protection documents. And they started with the G.39, um, which started uh, to uh, identify the ultra-long wavelength band, and actually it's the long and the ultra-long from 1625 to 1675 nanometers for the maintenance of fiber optic systems. And the term maintenance means several things. So it means, for example, if there's handshaking occurring out of band from, uh, say, a DWDM system, uh, then it can occur up into these maintenance bands. But at the same time, these maintenance bands are being um, assigned so that you can remotely monitor systems um, with an OTDR out of band so you, you can be on a live fiber, but you're at a different wavelength. And in this case, the WDMs would be uh, have to be placed at a patch panel net, and they normally add about 1 dB of attenuation to go through a WDM. Um, but you can also get these in racks and with integrated OTDRs, and that will show a picture of one of these uh, as we progress through as well. So the L.40 standard, there's three of these, L.39, 40, and 41. But the L.40 standard in particular um, talks about uh, the role of preventive 
um, and post-installation, post-fault maintenance roles of using an OTDR. And this is using either an OTDR or an optical power meter to monitor your network live. And what you're looking for is changes in attenuation. But you can also, with an OTDR, you can program it to look for changes in reflectance or attenuation as well and use it as, a, as this monitoring tool. Um, and of course, there has to be some type of switching capability and some type of overlay capability to be able to use this. So we have uh, the incorporation of basically a smarter OTDR. Now, uh, you can run your own OTDR 24-7 over a network. Star topologies or hub sites are recommended. And in this case, um, you would run the OTDR through an optical switch, and then the optical switch uh, would uh, select either dark fibers or would operate out of band on live fibers or both um, and do comparison measurements and that. So you're going to see a lot more activity with these capabilities, but it is something that if you want to engineer yourself, uh, your OTDR has the interfaces available for doing it. It has the menu selects where you can set programs to do this yourself as well. So what it does give you, though, is um, it's not intrusive from the outside. It's in real time. You can do overlays with pre-existing traces. Um, you can uh, provide quality control over dark fibers as well. And uh, you can set your thresholds and alarms appropriately. So what I did here was I took a, an OTDR and tested it three different wavelengths to show you the sensitivity of macro and micro bins. Now, uh, with, um, I probably should have mentioned this before, but a macro bend is bend radius, and a micro bend is a pinching effect. And uh, so you can see that at cursor A, uh, at the 1310 nanometer, which is the red line, that we're not even affected by these stresses. But at 1550, we start picking up these stresses, and at 1625 nanometers, it, they're much more pronounced. And, that, and it's because of this sensitivity at the longer wavelengths that the long and ultra long bands have been assigned for this role, is it will pick up faults that even 1550 will have problems uh, uh, identifying. So L.41 actually gave us a little more information on when and how to use this. So on case one here, down below, if 1310 nanometers being used, and that, that means that we can test or monitor at 1550, 1625, or 1650. In case two, where we're using the 1550 nanometer wavelength, which would be the case of, say, a DWDM system uh, or an analog uh, cable TV system, for example, then we'd be monitoring at 1625 or 1650. And then case three, the same thing, is uh, depending on which one's active, which wavelengths we want to use uh, for these. But we're always um, putting our maintenance wavelength, one wavelength or one channel up from the usable wavelength that's being used in that port. And this way, we're not, uh, we're not interfering with, uh, with normal uh, operation itself in that. So to talk about what's coming up into the future is next generation OTDRs and that because they are here and they are being implemented. Uh, the top is actually an SFP module um, and uh, in this case the OTDR functions are in the SFP and this is being uh, uh, transmitted along with the other channels DWDM, CWDM, uh, etc. And um, you know these are available on the market today. System manufacturers are already integrating these in this case a lot of times, so is uh, the service providers don't know about that these exist and that you can have them uh, integrated into your system. In this case, it's not going to give you the details of the OTDR. What it's going to give you in real time is that you have a problem and approximately where the problem is. Whether it's within 100 meters is really irrelevant. It's, it's one to say, at that point, if it's a break, you're going to bring out your OTDR, your conventional OTDR. This is to say, we have a problem. Here's the location, approximate location of the problem. And, um, and uh, give you that in real time and maybe save an hour till you can get an OTDR on site uh, to be able to find it. 
The other one, which is a more of a rack-mounted one, is where the uh, OTDR has been integrated with an optical switch. And these have been around for several decades. They're just now really coming into more popularity because of the extent of the, the amount of fibers and the amount of wavelengths that are being transported over an optical fiber. And uh, again, there is cost associated with these, so they work best at hub sites, but uh, depending on your need, they could be remote a, as well. And again, um, you know, we're looking at um, initial information. We're doing overlay traces to these, and we're doing comparisons based on how you program your uh, OTDR. And, uh, so regardless, one of the main things with OTDRs is you still have to know where your plant is and that where a splice is, where a connection is. And when we deal with, in this case, a, a, an aerial plant, and we've got sag. And again, the OTDR doesn't measure cable length. It measures fiber length. So there's a lot of opportunities to, to be off as much as 5% on accuracy on location. So a couple things, good documentation. Use GIS systems to tag splice points, slack cable points. Uh, keep your as-built uh, documents current with what uh, fibers, what cables are located where um, for it. And, uh, and then if you want to um, um, identify the, the difference between cable index refraction and fiber index refraction, it's one of the topics we're going to pick up in the advanced workshop at ISE as well. So um, let's go on to one more thing here, just the patch panels. Patch panels are, are critical to, to our needs. But it also, besides giving us a test point and giving us a cross-connect point, it gives us an access point for a WDM or an optical switch to where we can use them for um, the fiber monitoring functions. And uh, it's very critical to keep these clean, keep dust caps on them. But even if they're dust capped, clean the connectors anyway. And that cleanliness is critical. And one last thing on that topic, if you're going to test a lot of fibers and that from an OTDR, don't insert them into the OTDR's port. T insert them into the end of the patch cord. If you have to replace a patch cord, it's a far easier and less costly function than the, uh, than the OTDR's connector. So in summary, lasers are sensitive to Fresnel reflections. The OTDR is designed to measure reflectance and optical return loss. It is as important to measure reflectance and optical return loss as it is attenuation and distance with an OTDR, and it needs to be part of your testing disciplines and that for you. So with that, we're going to go to the Q&A session. Hello, Janice. Okay, so um, uh, Janice is offline for the moment, so please explain the difference between macro bend and micro bend. A micro bend is a pinch, and the macro bend is a bend radius. And remember that as wavelength increases, the sensitivity um, to these effects are much greater. And so one of the advantages of testing at 1625 or 1650 is you'll pick up faults and problems that you won't see at your conventional 1310 and, and 1550 nanometers. Okay? And uh, the second question here. Sorry about is, that, Larry. Larry, I'm back on. I was on mute and I couldn't get off quick enough, so <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay. The next question uh, we'll go into here is, does my entire network currently uses UPC connectors? We have recently upgraded from 10 gigabyte, gigabytes excuse me, to 40. Uh, communications on some of our new of our connectors. Do I need to start considering APC equipment? A um, couple things here. One is you do need to know the reflectance and the age of the, your existing um, UPC. I'm assuming that you're talking 50, 55 dB, but um, the SPC and PC people still call out as UPC as well. So make sure it is that. Um, secondly, it, is, it was giga, uh, gigabits and all this. It, it was capital B in the question. So, um, but anyway. Um, 
So uh, APC, you can never go wrong with APC pigtails and uh, term and patch cords because it allows you just tremendous flexibility. But the bottom line is is the the ORL value um, that would come from your system manufacturer specifications. They would give you the value you need to determine whether it's a UPC or APC. And uh, if needed, uh, you can email me directly, and we'll give my email address later um, on the next few slides or so before we close. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, I think I, question, I, I answered that. Great, thanks for that clarification. Dead zone box versus launch cable. Uh, they're exactly the same. It's just one of them's a cable and one of them's packaged in a box. And that, but they both they meet the re, they have to meet the requirements of either the TIA 455 or the IEC 61280 standards. So if anything, if you're going to buy these from anybody, ask them who are they manufacturing these against, which standard or so, just to make sure they know what they're doing inside and giving you the right length as well. Great. Um, we have a question here asking about, are you seeing companies uh, integrating OTDR with GIS, Geographic Information System, to help identify the geographical location of fibers? And then if yes, what are some of the common methods of integration and how are they using the results? Yeah, I'm going to have to take that one offline and now this because it is product specific. But yes, you are, but in the second part of that is uh, d definitely the GIS mapping is taking place to identify uh, whether it's a turn in a cable route, a mid-entry, a splice point, um, you know, any of those tasks, we want to know where they are in the physical plant. And that, and so the GIS function is very critical to use. And even if you don't have GIS in your OTDR, then uh, use, use your phone or, or something to get those mappings for it. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, will 1625NM uh, be phased out as a testing wavelength? No, as a matter of fact, uh, the 1625 and the 1650 nanometer um, uh, spectrums have been specifically assigned for testing and maintenance by the ITU. This was the reason for them. They're so sensitive to finding faults that they can see uh, events that the uh, 13, 10, 15, 15 nanometers won't see. And for that reason, uh, I applaud the ITU in particular for, for taking that effort and uh, to um, get the word out into the industry. And even as we're doing here, we're trying to make sure people understand. So maybe when you're budgeting for your next OTDR that you maybe don't want one of them at least to have that uh, ultra or ultra long uh, capability for testing and troubleshooting. Okay, thanks. This is a, I, I don't know if this is going to be uh, something you may want to take offline as well, but it, they're asking for a best system to clean connectors. Um, y yeah, I'll take that one offline. There's, there's so, okay. if that's the webinar subject by itself. <laughs> well, <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> There's so, much, there's so many different variations and all this, and it gets one. The, the bottom line, though, is is are you getting a good, clean image, and you're not inducing uh, any type of contaminants to the end face of either of the plugs, and that not just one mm -hmm. side. So you have the male and female side that have to be cleaned, uh, and the mated side as well. So. so. Right, right. Okay, so uh, David, he'll get back to you on that. There's a couple of different, uh, obviously, a lot more in depth about that. Um, let's see here. Are OTDRs accurate enough for insertion loss testing compared to handheld optical transmitters slash receivers? I take it he's he's meaning optical power meters. Um, um, no, the OTDR is not designed. It's not the calibrated instrument that an optical power meter is. The optical power meter is very traceable to NIST standards, and they have to be calibrated. There's requirements. Normally, every year, 
some cases manufacturers say every two, but they're an absolute measurement device, and that an OTDR is a theoretical instrument. And while, but we can do things with an OTDR that we cannot do with an optical power meter. In other words, we can't measure length. You know, we're not. Uh, well, we can see the effects of a macro micro bin. We don't see them, and that. So, uh, two different instruments. The oh, the optical power meter is the more accurate for power measurements and loss measurements, but the OTDR is pretty good. All right. Um, do APC unused ports need to have a terminator installed? It depends on the location of the APC because remember in the one graph I said the, the worst uh, case was where it's located in proximity to the original laser, number one. Number two, the type of signal, whether it's, a, a, say, an amplitude modulated uh, signal at, or a, um, an optically multiplex, say, a DWDM um, signal. In those cases, uh, those front panel connections, um, you know, um, because they're mated, you know, we're suppressing them pretty, um, pretty good. As you go further down the span, say, if it's a passive optical network where APCs are used, you could have a problem there, and if that's the case, then your um, your OTDR would identify that your reflectance level from that splitter would be high. It wouldn't tell you which splitter port because they're all uniform and at the same distance, but it would tell you that you've got a high reflectance there, and in that case, I'd put a terminator in. Um, the far end one, because that signal is attenuated all the way back, is probably not going to be a problem. I, I would be more concerned with splitter ports or short distance uh, uh, analog systems or DWDM systems. Okay, wonderful, thanks. Uh, here's a question. Explain DB in relation to reflectance and attenuation. Are they the same? Um, well, they're both 10 log, but um, you know, in attenuation, as we say, we got a 10 dB loss in a span. Um, you know, that means that we've, you know, that boy. Um, so you got 90% of your signal, you know, is still going through. So 20 dB, you're down to 1%. On 10 dB, you lost 90%. On 20 dB, you added 10 more dB in that, and you lost another uh, 90%. So we're down to 1%. And now this on reflectance, even though it's still dB and it's still a percentage of signal, what you'll see is the higher the number in reflectance, the, the better the value is for you. It goes the opposite on attenuation. On attenuation, we want the uh, the lower the number, 0.1 dB versus 1 dB. Uh, we're on reflectance. We'd rather have a, a 60 dB reflectance and a 50 dB reflectance. All right. Another question here is, uh, what results do you look for in OTDR cable uh, acceptance testing? Um, well, I, I typically we use industry standards for say fiber attenuation, but uh, but it depends. Uh, you know, for the pond standards, for example, the the specification at at uh, 15 50 nanometers is 0.3 dB per kilometer, and at 13 10 it's uh, 0.4 dB per kilometer, but you can get better fiber and cable specs than that. So, you know, in one case, that's the worst case value I would use. Connector values are 0.5 dB per telcordia. Splice values are 0.1 dB per telcordia. So I'll typically use industry-driven values first. And then, but what happens is people engineer systems, they're trying to eliminate regenerators or making sure they have enough optical power for future ads, moves, and changes. And so they'll tighten their specifications up. As long as you don't tighten it up to the point where it's unobtainable, and, and I see that more with fusion splices where people try to go to two hundredths of a dB and yet you, you haven't considered fiber tolerances, which can uh, make it impossible to hit those values. So, um, yeah, industry standards for the most part. And uh, I'm looking for the OTDR to measure length. I'm looking for it to uh, measure reflectance. I'm looking at it for attenuation at uh, the 1310, 1550 minimum, you know, uh, and then preferably 1625 or 1650. Um, I would also like to see somebody do an adjustment uh, to match the sequential uh, sheath footed uh, sheath length to the actual fiber, which means you have to increase your index of refraction number uh, to a higher number than what's given, which is the number that the fiber manufacturers give to the cable numbers and it has nothing to do with the cable uh, markings themselves. All right. 
Uh, is OLTS testing a standard for FTTX testing? Um, it, that's a tougher one. Um, it can be in that, but it depends on who's responsible for what. So if I take a FTTX as a point-to-point, -point, yes, definitely. If I take it as a point-to-multi-point, -point, then I may do optical loss testing only to the splitter, and that, and then I'll just do power measurements from the splitter to the, the ONT, which shouldn't be more than 1 dB you know, per drop. Um, again, that may be a question we want to take offline because it gets more in-depth for it. Okay, wonderful. How much different is OTTR checking upon compared to an active Ethernet connection? And then follow up is how does it respond to an optical splitter? Oh, good question. Um, well, you know, point to point networks, the active Ethernet are simple. The, all the OTDR work you probably have done in the past has been point to point networks. So you, you probably won't differentiate it um, for it. However, once you put the splitter in, now the dynamic range of the OTDR is affected. So instead of having a 30 or 35 dB dynamic range OTDR, you're going to need one that's in the 40 to 50 dB dynamic range with 43 dB being about the sweet spot. So in one case, you need the dynamic range. On the other one, you need to shorten the pulse width because the drops from the splitter to the uh, subscriber are much shorter. And you're going to have to increase the averaging. And that, again, this, this is a good topic we're going to be spending time at ISE on, too, and we'll be able to do those tests. And you can see for yourself in that firsthand. It's, re it's really unique. But you can't use a conventional 35 dB dynamic range OTDR and test through a 1 by 32 splitter. You're not going to have enough uh, dynamic range to do so. Okay, great. So be sure to attend that uh, session. What kind of connectors would you suggest for FTPX networks? Uh, and then there's a follow-up to it. Um, our passive devices have a um, mix of APC and PC connectors with two levels of splitting, stage 1, 1 by 4, and stage 2, 1 by 8. Okay, so it's a, he's got a distributed architecture that he's using with um, you know cascaded splitters and that for it. And uh, the the reason for the APC again was worst case analog circuits being um, multiplexed in at fifteen fifteen nanometers. But the the fourteen ninety basic band and thirteen ten upstream O band um, that's conventional digital uh, transmission and the the UPC. Um, the ultra physical uh, contact uh, connections which should work just fine there, and that. And again, you can look at your the transmission specifications for reflectance and ORL, and they confirm that. Uh, as far as the distributed splitting, going from one splitter to another splitter, um, really the only reason you'd be probably doing both is because you're digital on on the on one end anyway and all this and if you can do digital uh, if you if you can do analog you can always do digital not the other way around and that so uh, and if you want to we can take that offline in the more depth if needed and again these are demonstrations we're going to do at ISE centralized home run uh, distributed um, uh, topologies with different splitters and different polishes so it should be a lot of fun Okay, so we have a little quiet time here. So um, let's, uh, there may be questions that I was not able to get to, so uh, I will address those electronically and that um, as well. Uh, so for anybody that I wasn't able to get back to, thank you for the questions. I will get back to you as well. As well. And uh, also there's um, a... Um, should be a question answer period slide here. Uh, Janice, yeah. are you still on? Okay. I got I <laughs> I got dropped. Imagine that. <laughs> that still actually does happen. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, let me see here. We've got um, one more question. We've got actually a couple more here. Um, okay. Can I measure mechanical stress applied onto a fiber during cable lane with an OTDR? 
Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, matter of fact, one of my most fun projects I ever did was a rail plow and uh, up in Alaska, and we were monitoring the placement of the cable live uh, with an OTDR from a remote while the cable was being placed. And where, where we were looking at it was doing dB per kilometer at the longer wavelength, so 15, 15 nanometers back then, but it'd be 16, 25 now. And, and we were able to differentiate immediately if there was any stress. And in one case, we ended up having a point we had to stop the plow, and that. And uh, fortunately, it was operator error um, on the OTDR operator that it uh, forgot that he was in a two-point um, measurement. And as the cable kept being placed, the two markers placed, and actually one went up the Fresnel reflection. But yes, definitely um, use the OTDR from uh, the remote. But of course, you have to have the pigtails on, or at least uh, have an access to it. So um, should be very good, you know. Okay, great. Uh, I know we're going slightly over time, but if you're okay, I've got two uh, more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, let's see here. How do you remotely monitor a, two, a P2MP network on GIS up onto the ONT? Okay, um, interesting question because you could also ask how do we um, locate the fiber um, on an OTDR up to the ONT after the splitter and the same thing, same because on the OTDR we can't differentiate one fiber from another if it's an equal split, number one. So we have a problem there. So at the same time, how are we going to know which fiber is which uh, on a mapping? The OTDR is not going to tell us, but we can say that this fiber port one out of the, the splitter would be... Uh, um, you know, on this setting and go into this location. So it can be done, but we're not going to be able to do it, uh, to match it up optically with an OTDR unless they are different lengths in that. In this case, we can tell the length, but we can't, they'll overlay each other on the waveform itself. Okay. All right. This will be the last one to wrap it up here. Uh, would you mention the existence of gainer splices? Slices and that they should be addressed um, so the audience is aware of them and not rejecting network acceptance. I don't know what they mean, so I'll have you talk about that. Okay. If it's appropriate. Uh, all fibers have tolerances, and that and most of the time when people talk about single mode fiber tolerances, they talk about the the. the core diameter or mode field diameter technically and the cladding diameter the, but there's also ovality and there's core cladding concentricity so you get a, a variety of different um, tolerances but what can happen is that because the OTDR run, uh, operates on Raleigh backscatter the theory um, that you get a certain amount of um, uh, reflections coming back from the fiber and of course if the, the mode field diameter of uh, fiber uh, B is larger than fiber A, then the OTDR sees an increase in backscatter and it displays what it sees. And that's what I meant earlier, that it's a theoretical instrument. So what would happen, you'd have a waveform coming down and then all of a sudden you get an increase in backscatter and that would show as a gain splice. Um, at the other end of that next section, though, you would have from a, a larger backscatter to a smaller backscatter, and it would drop back down. So the different tests and measurement standards have identified that uh, splices should be bidirectionally averaged. So you, if you... Um, had a gain in one direction, then you had a high loss in the other. You averaged the two together, and that would give you your bidirectionally averaged splice loss. And yes, they do occur quite often, uh, especially with single mode fibers because of the tight tolerances. And, and, and even with a mode field diameter of, say, 8.7 microns plus or minus 0.7 on either side, uh, they can happen quite a bit. And, that, and so fortunately, the standards bodies have addressed this and given a, a method to bidirectionally average these to, to be able to comply and, and have your splices fall within spec. Good question. All right, great. Thanks for that uh, detail on those standards. So uh, with that, please, if you have other questions, you can see Larry's email here on the screen, Larry at lightbrigade.com. Uh, you can get in touch with him directly, um, and he will be very kind, I'm sure, and get back to you with a, a good answer and response. So with that all, we have gone over our lot of time, but thank you so much for staying in tune. Or if you want to come back and review things, please do so on the recording. Have a great day. Thanks so much for attending, and stay tuned for more information on upcoming ISE webinars on, in your inbox or on our website. Have a great day, and again, thanks for joining.
Bye-bye.